hey, it's Huck. And I know how I would rule in the George Zimmerman case. But first I should clarify just a few things. I can't say I watched every moment of the televised trial, so there's the possibility that something may have been said or introduced uh, that may have changed my mind. And unlike the six women who will decide Zimmerman's fate, I have had the opportunity to read and watch any number of commentaries on the case, which may or may not have influenced my decision. But of all the criteria that separate me from those women on the jury, three stand out. One, I'm not a woman with kids of my own who may see this case on a more personal, emotional basis than I do. Two, to sit on this jury, you pretty much have had to be ignorant of news coverage of the case, or at least claim to be unknowledgeable of the massive news coverage leading up to this trial. Sadly, this is a reminder that so many who sit on juries in this country must first demonstrate a complete lack of knowledge, or for that matter, any interest in what happens in the world around them. Imagine. Uh, putting your case in the hands of six folks whose little community made national headlines, fostered wall-to-wall -wall cable news coverage, and was the stage of thousands strong marches and rallies, as this community was during the weeks leading up to the charges ultimately being filed in this case. What cave in Sayborn, Florida did these six women emerge from to be clueless about this case? It really makes you wonder. Who lied more in this case, Zimmerman to make himself seem the victim rather than the instigator, or those six women to get themselves on the jury? But ultimately, it is a third factor that, at least for me, may be the deciding one in how I come down in Zimmerman's verdict. And this is something I reckon few, if any, of the women on the jury can draw from in their own life experience though perhaps I'm wrong about that. My life experience includes at least one memorable incident in which I, all alone in the dark, was followed by someone, which was clear to me as soon as I realized that the footfalls behind me quickened their pace in time to my own. Anyone who has ever experienced that feeling knows the fear is real. And my life experience also includes more than one incident, one as an adult, where out of nowhere and completely unprovoked, I was suddenly assaulted. In one of these incidents, I was thrown to the ground and my head pounded into the sidewalk, much as Zimmerman describes his encounter. But unlike Zimmerman, at no time in each of these assaults Though I admit to getting the raw end in each of them, did I ever truly fear for my life? Of being injured, yes. In one of these cases, the guy bit through my ear. In another, a solid right cross to my nose caused intense pain, not to mention plenty of blood. But being a guy, I guess, I knew the difference between being on the receiving end of an ass whipping and being in a fight for my very life. As for Zimmerman's injuries, frankly, I've seen more blood after shaving. So I'm not buying his excuse that he felt the scrapes he apparently got to the back of his head or the nosebleed caused him to think that this kid with a bag of Skittles was determined to kill him. In fact, there's an awful lot of what Zimmerman had to say to the police, in his deposition, in his TV interview with Sean Hannity on Fox News that simply can't pass the smell test. And if we were to assume Zimmerman felt his life in real jeopardy, as we must in order to acquit him, well in this case we don't have an awful lot to go on besides his own version of events. And so much of it is clearly lies. Lies to mitigate the circumstances that found him killing a 17-year-old teenager who was minding his own business, walking home from the store with a bag of Skittles and a can of iced tea while talking on his cell phone to someone back home. Let's be clear about this. 
Trayvon Martin did absolutely nothing wrong up to the instant where we have only Zimmerman's word that it was Trayvon who initiated the confrontation. If some facts are clear, it's clear Zimmerman got out of his car armed with a loaded weapon and followed Trayvon Martin. He admitted this in his own words to the police dispatcher. Only later did he amend this confession to say that he only got out of the car and walked down the sidewalk so he could identify the street where he saw Trayvon. <laughs> really? Zimmerman is saying that he did not know the name of the street in the same three-street development in which he himself lives and had previously reported from at least 40 sometimes to report, quote, suspicious activities. Now, I don't know about you, but I live in a small town of less than 10,000 folks, and I can name pretty much every street, even those cross town two miles away. Zimmerman told police Trayvon jumped out of nowhere and started this confrontation. But that doesn't explain how it is that Martin found himself a hundred yards from his car to be confronted in the first place. Now maybe we are to assume the teenager had no right to stand his ground. Only the man 90 pounds heavier, twice his age, you know, the man with the gun, had such a right. Zimmerman says he was pinned to the ground, his head beaten into the cement, and his mouth covered by Martin's hands, and that this is about the time the teen either grabbed the gun or attempted to reach for it. You know, the gun that was behind Zimmerman's back, which was pinned to the ground. And we still don't know which version to believe. Did they wrestle for the gun, as Zimmerman said in his original statement to the police, or did he beat Martin to the holster as he later described it? You know, funny how that 911 tape by the neighbor didn't seem to back up Zimmerman's account of being muzzled by Martin's hands. The screams and shouts are pretty clear to me. And finally, what are we to make of Zimmerman's statement that Martin said to him as he reached for the gun, you're gonna die tonight, motherfucker. How convenient. This 17-year-old kid who just a moment ago was looking forward to getting back to sit and watch the NBA All-Star game with his dad suddenly decided to throw his life away in order to commit murder because of a sidewalk encounter with an asshole. I don't believe anything George Zimmerman has said in this case. Where there is any evidence available, it shows him lying. He knew the street, he followed the kid, his mouth was clearly never muzzled before the gun was fired, and there was not even any blood or DNA on Trayvon Martin's hands or fingernails. Now, I can't say with certainty that Zimmerman committed second-degree murder, because I can't climb into his head to understand just how depraved or pathological his regard for another human life is. Though it seems likely he had a low opinion of black folks dressed in hoodies walking around his neighborhood. What I do know is that Trayvon Martin cannot speak for himself in this case. Zimmerman deprived him of that chance. And so we must judge Zimmerman largely by his own words and inconsistencies. The fact that he felt so compelled to embellish the facts and lie to appear innocent tells me beyond any reasonable doubt that he's hiding the guilt he senses people would reasonably assess to him if given a completely accurate account of himself. Guilty of manslaughter would be my verdict. And I think the women of this jury might just agree that if we are going to have these crazy laws where largely untrained, and in this case, Zimmerman's case, unstable, prejudiced individuals are going to be carrying around loaded guns in our neighborhoods, it may be time to send a message that we are going to hold these folks to a pretty high standard. Anyway, I'm Huck, 
That's my opinion. What's yours?